I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. David Olson. David is an associate professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and neuroscience at the University of California, Davis. His lab studies a class of compounds called psychoplastogens, which are small molecules capable of promoting neural plasticity in the brain. His lab is on the cutting edge when it comes to understanding the mechanisms by which psychedelics and other psychoactive drugs work in the brain, and we spent most of our conversation discussing this research. We touched on everything from the latest research from his lab, including things related to the drug ibogaine, to new tools they are developing and using to understand these drugs and how they work, to the question of whether it's likely that we'll actually be able to produce non-hallucinogenic drug variants of classic psychedelics, which are capable of eliciting therapeutic mental health outcomes, but without triggering psychedelics states of consciousness. We touched on a variety of things related to those areas. My conversation with David got cut a little short for scheduling reasons, but his lab is doing a lot of fascinating fascinating research in this area, and there will likely be several major discoveries coming from his lab in the next few months. So I hope, I hope to have him back on the podcast at some point in the coming year. As always, if you enjoy the content of this podcast, please do like, share, or subscribe. You can subscribe to the video version on YouTube. You could subscribe to my free weekly science newsletter, Mind and Matter, on Substack. That's mindandmatter.substack.com. You can also sign up for the paid newsletter, which gets early access to episodes of the podcast, as well as some other content that you can't find elsewhere. You can also just tell people about the podcast. If you enjoy the content here and you just tell one or two people about the podcast and why you like it, that can actually be very effective at getting more listeners. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can Mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. And with that, here's my conversation with David Olson. David Olson, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Can you start off by just telling everyone who you are and, and what your background is scientifically? Sure. So I'm an, uh, an associate professor at the University of California, Davis, in the Department of Chemistry and the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Medicine. And I'd say my, my background, scientific background, is in chemical neuroscience, broadly speaking. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in chemistry and biology. Uh, I did my my postdoctoral training at Stanford in chemistry, but I worked in a lab that was, uh, you know, very, you know, heavily involved in chemical neuroscience, the development of new molecules for treating brain, uh, for treating um, neurological conditions, particularly in this case, you know, this is a lab that's very well known for taking uh, traditional toxins like saxitoxin, tetrodotoxin, and modifying their chemical structures to turn them into medicines for neuropathic pain. Uh, and then I went on from, from there to do my postdoctoral research in neuroscience in the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research at the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard. And there, you know, I did everything from small molecule uh, CNS medicinal chemistry uh, to molecular cellular neurobiology to behavioral neuropharmacology. Uh, 
And I started my independent career at UC Davis in 2015. And my academic lab, um, it, 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 you know, it spans the gamut, you know, soup to nuts, molecules to mice. Uh, we have a lot of chemists in the group. We also have a lot of molecular, cellular neurobiologists, and we have a whole bunch of behavioral uh, neuroscientists as well. And our, our primary focus is on the development of new drugs for treating brain disorders. Interesting. So, so you mentioned in some of your earlier training, you had done work where you were modifying existing drugs or toxins in order to basically try and create medicines. Can you talk a little bit about um, how that process works? So you mentioned something called tr tetrodotoxin. We can maybe take that as an example. What is something like that? Where is it found in nature? And what are you actually doing in the lab to tinker with it? Yeah. So to be clear, when I was in that lab, it's, it's the Dubois lab at Stanford. Um, the lab was very interested in this. So I was very immersed in neuroscience, but what I specifically focused on there was the synthesis of nitrogen containing compounds. And so I developed new reactions, new methods, new strategies to producing uh, these types of molecules. And the reason that's important is because in my mind, uh, as a CNS medicinal chemist, is that pretty much all of the psychoactive drugs that we care about have nitrogens in them. And mm. so, you know, just from a, a basic chemistry perspective, you know, I gained a lot of experience in how to construct these molecules. Now, the rest of the lab, there was, you know, a, another section of the lab that were actually modifying toxins like saxitoxin and tetrodotoxin. And, you know, those molecules come from a couple of different places, but uh, tetrodotoxin is probably best known for being the toxin found in the fugu fish, you know, puffer fish. And so puffer fish toxin and every neuroscience Scientist knows of tetrodotoxin because we use it in, you know, in our assays to block voltage gated sodium channels. Um, and it turns out that these voltage gated sodium channels uh, are also involved in chronic pain. And so by tweaking the structure of these molecules, you can, uh, you know, change the pharmacokinetic properties of the molecule, you can change the pharmacodynamic properties, how it binds to the receptor, where it binds to the receptor, and then hopefully you can produce uh, therapies that can, that can be used in the clinic without a whole bunch of adverse effects. And so that's actually the, uh, the, um, the, the basis for a company that uh, my, my good friend, John Mulcahy, uh, and, and my former boss, uh, Justin Dubois, um, they started a company called Site One Therapeutics, and they're trying to to use these these toxins uh, to treat to treat neuropathic pain. So, what would for someone without a neuroscience background, how would you describe the the difference between a molecule that is a toxin, something like tetrodotoxin that's very deadly, versus a molecule that's a psychoactive drug, versus something that is more innocuous. What what is the difference in terms of how those molecules are actually behaving inside the brain that explains that difference? Oh, in well, well, first we need to separate this completely. Like tetrodotoxin, saxitoxin, these are super water soluble compounds. They don't cross the blood brain barrier. These are not acting as central, essentially acting agents. They're working in the periphery. Um, you know, affecting, uh, you know, neurons in the spinal cord and other parts of the body, but not necessarily in the brain. Uh, what I focus on now in my academic lab are molecules that uh, work centrally, you know, they, they get into the brain to, to produce their effects. Now, in terms of how you modify a drug to, to make it safer, um, it involves a lot, of, a lot of medicinal chemistry. And so the idea is, is pretty simple, actually. If you think about a drug, you know, the structure of a drug, there are certain features of it that give rise to the beneficial properties that you're looking for. And there are other features of it that give rise to kind of the, the, the more undesired properties. And so you basically have to look for a way to remove the, uh, the sections of the drug that give rise to the undesired properties, but retain the parts of the drug that are necessary for its desired effects. I see. And would you say... So for example, if you have a drug that's got um, effects that are desirable and beneficial in some way and effects that are undesirable, how do you think about those in terms of, say, the receptors the drugs are interacting with? I mean, it, it depends, drug to drug, mm -hmm. uh, ca ca you know, case by case. But, um, you know, most CNS active drugs uh, exhibit very robust, uh, diverse polypharmacology, meaning that they hit lots of different receptors. And sometimes there are off-target receptors that give rise to the deleterious effects or the undesired effects. And then you can basically design a molecule that won't bind to those, but still binds to your intended target. 
Uh, that's very common, especially when some of your, your uh, undesired targets or off targets, as we would call them, are in the periphery. So for instance, in the case of, of psychedelics, a very common off target um, uh, protein would be the 5-HT2B receptor in the heart. Uh, this is known to cause cardiac valvulopathy. And so if you're designing a new version of a psychedelic or something similar to it, you probably want to try to avoid activating 5-HT2B receptors in the heart um, just to, to avoid that kind of peripheral complication. I see. So, so a way of thinking about this would be you've got some chemical you've got some molecule. It's got some kind of structure. That molecule will very often bind to a large or relatively large number of receptors throughout the brain and or body. And the action that it has at, on some of those might lead to a beneficial outcome. The action that it leads that has on, on others might have a deleterious or bad outcome. And literally what you can do as a chemist in a lab like yours is chop off or change pieces of that molecule to retain some of those beneficial interactions, but get rid of some of the ones that might be problematic. That's right. I mean, um, molecular structure dictates function. And so if you have the ability to change molecular structure, you can tweak and tune the functional effects of the drug. Hmm. So you, you mentioned um, that some psychedelics bind to this receptor called 5-HT2B. Now, on this podcast, we've talked with a number of experts on psychedelics, and, and typically there you talk about the so-called psychedelic receptor, 5-HT2A, the, the particular mm -hmm. serotonin receptor that underlies a lot of the hallucinogenic effects. So what is this other receptor, 5-HT2B? Can you elaborate on why it's of concern here and maybe what are some of the compounds that are known to activate it? So um, it's a related receptor to the 5-HT2A. It's very similar in structure, um, but it's found in a different location in the body. So whereas 5-HT2A is primer, primarily expressed um, on layer five pyramidal neurons in the cortex of the brain, it's, it's found everywhere in the body, the 5-HT2A receptor, you know, even in the gut and in immune cells. But when we think about it in terms of its effects on the hallucinogenic effects of psychedelics, we're talking about 5-HT2A receptors in the brain. Uh, 5-HT2B receptors do not have high brain expression, and they're mainly expressed in the heart. Um, and they can impact, you know, the functioning of those heart cells and, and lead to, to valvulopathies uh, that obviously are, are undesired. What, what does that mean, basically, that word valvulopathy? The, the, heart, the heart is not functioning properly. <laughs> yeah, so at least now, heart issues. Now, there, you know, there are other... Uh, you know, receptors, ion channels in the heart that are very common off target effects for a lot of drugs, particularly greasy amines like psychedelics. And one common one is the HERG channel. So a HERG channel is, is an ion channel that's found in the heart and can lead to cardiac arrhythmias. And this is particularly problematic with a molecule like Ibogaine. Uh, Ibogaine is known to inhibit HERG channels and, and several people have died uh, after taking Ibogaine due to, you know, cardiac arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. Are there any other um, psychedelic drugs that people may have heard of that have this effect on the 5-HT2B receptors in the heart? Yeah, most of them. Um, I think, uh, you know, psilocin, LSD, I, you know, I think they all have, you know, high affinity and efficacy for 5-HT2B. But so, um, so you mentioned Ibogaine. Can you, before we sort of get into the specifics of the research that you've done, can you give people some background here? What is Ibogaine? Where is it found naturally? And, and what is its um, traditional use? Sure. Ibogaine is a, a psychoactive natural product. Um, it's actually found in a whole bunch of plants all over the world, but um, most people know it from uh, a shrub in West Africa. Um, so what is it used traditionally? I mean, I think it's used for, you know, ritualistic purposes in, in, um, in some indigenous populations in, in Africa. Um, but, you know, Ibogaine has been, you know, the effects of Ibogaine have been known for, for quite some time. Um, in particular at higher doses, it seems to have, you know, via anecdotal reports and open label clinical trials, I should say there's nothing, you know, more substantial, uh, than that. Um, those studies seem to suggest that Ibogaine might have some anti-addictive properties, um, there's been some reports that a single administration of Ibogaine can keep heroin addicts drug free for, uh, you know, up to six months. 
And then with a second additional dose, they can be drug free for up to, you know, up to three years in some cases. Um, and actually, Ibogaine was sold as an antidepressant in France for many years before it was pulled from the market due to its adverse effects. Uh, the adverse effects being, you know, things like this cardiotoxicity that I mentioned, but also, you know, some, some hallucinogenic effects at high doses. Hmm. And tra traditionally, how's that consumed? How did people actually take that? Yeah, there, it's, it's found primarily in the root bark of this, uh, this plant, Tabernantha boga. And so I think people will grind it up and consume it, consume it like that, like a, a lot of, you know, uh, plant material. I see. And so it's, it's got these interesting potential therapeutic properties, but it's also got these potentially undesirable properties, especially this cardiotoxicity that it can have, um, via this other serotonin receptor. So the approach so that you guys, the, the cardiotoxicity for Ibogaine comes from the ion channel, the HERG channel. That's the primary issue of that. Yep. I see. And so you guys have done some interesting research on this and can you describe the basic approach for people? You took the Ibogaine molecule and then you modified it and did some interesting tests on it. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar to what I was describing before. We, you know, Ibogaine is a complex natural product. It's big. Um, and it's, it's hard to synthesize. Actually, there are no de novo total syntheses of Ibogaine that would produce the drug in quantities necessary for like human clinical trials. And so to get our hands on it, like you need to extract it from the natural sources, which is problematic for a whole bunch of reasons, including, you know, the environmental effects, but also getting like high drug, you know, purity for, you know, medicinal grade uh, compounds. It'd be better to be able to synthesize it de novo. And so um, we took Ibogaine and we, we simply started chopping it up. Uh, we started removing different parts of the molecule to see how that would impact, um, you know, its functional effects, particularly its effects at that, that herd channel that I was telling you about. And by chopping off a lot of the grease, we were able to reduce its potency on herd pretty substantially, reduce its cardiotoxicity, but we found that it still was a pretty effective um, anti-addictive compound. And it also seemed to have antidepressant effects as well. Hmm. And then how do you actually test something like that in mouse models? How do you test that something has anti-addictive properties? So uh, the anti-addictive effects things that we did is, you know, in cells, one of the things that we really look for when trying to identify new antidepressants is we, we focus on class of molecules that are really good at promoting structural neuroplasticity and cortical neurons. And so I probably should take a step back and describe why we care about that first before we get into, you know, the in vivo effects of these drugs. So, so something that's really important to remember is that a hallmark of, of all stress-related neuropsychiatric diseases and many other brain disorders. But with the stress-related neuropsychiatric diseases, I'm talking about things like depression, PTSD, and substance use disorder. And a hallmark of all of those illnesses is really the atrophy of neurons in a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. So the neurons actually physically shrivel up. And so if you think of a neuron like a tree, you know, the branches would be the dendrites and the leaves would be the synapses. And in many of these illnesses, the leaves fall off and the branches get pruned. And that's problematic because that impairs the ability of the cortex to communicate with other parts of the brain. And normally the PFC uh, uh, talks to a whole bunch of other subcortical regions that regulate things like motivation, fear, reward, mood. Um, and so by restoring the ability of the PFC to effectively communicate with other parts of the brain, that's how we can produce really good antidepressants. And it turns out that every single antidepressant that we know of uh, has the ability to regrow these, these critical neurons. They just do so on a time scale that correlates with our therapeutic efficacy. So something like a traditional uh, SSRI, we know that uh, those drugs take weeks to months uh, to demonstrate any efficacy in the clinic. And it turns out it also takes them weeks to months of chronic administration to regrow those critical neurons. Now, something like ketamine or a psychedelic, uh, those drugs are really good at regrowing these neurons very quickly. And they can do this within 24 hours in vivo, and the effects are relatively long-lasting after a single administration. Uh, 
And so one of the things that we look for in antidepressant compounds, and we started calling these molecules cycloplastogens, is the ability to promote cortical neuron growth very robustly. And so in the case of these, these ibogaine derivatives that we're talking about, um, we screen them in uh, some cellular assays looking for structural neuroplasticity. So we basically grew up neurons in a dish, um, added compounds, and look for phenotypic changes in structure. Uh, so we can do some microscopy and, and look for changes in dendritic branching, dendritic spine growth, uh, things like that, synaptogenesis. Um, from there, of course, we move on to in vivo studies, and these are primarily done in, in, in rodent models. Um, and we can look inside the brains of rodents to look for these same physical structural changes. And uh, from there, we can perform some behavioral tests. Now, I should emphasize that, you know, rodents are not people. <laughs> and there is no one test that recapitulates the complexity of a human neuropsychiatric disease in rodents. But what there are, are a whole bunch of tests that kind of give you an idea of circuit readouts. And so, as I was mentioning before, our goal really has been able, has been to to alter the function of those PFC neurons. We know that they play a critical role in depression. And we know that there are certain circuits in, in the mouse brain that produce certain behavioral effects. And so we can use those as readouts of, of activating the appropriate antidepressant-like circuits. I see. So whether it's depression or many other neuropsychiatric conditions, a core feature of what happens in the brain typically is you get a literal physical atrophy of connections between certain neurons, particularly those in the prefrontal cortex. And these drugs that you're interested in that you're calling psychoplastogens are just any drug that's good at regrowing some of those physical connections in those types of neurons. That's right. So what are some, you, you mentioned some, but what are, what are some of the prominent examples of a psychoplastogen? You mentioned ketamine. What are some of the other ones that we know about that you've looked at in the lab? So um, in 2018, our group uh, published a paper demonstrating that most of the serotonergic psychedelics are very good psychoplastogens from a variety of different chemical classes. We're talking ergolines like LSD, um, tryptamines like dimethyltryptamine, 5-MeO-DMT, psilocin, uh, amphetamines like DOI, even, even compounds like MDMA uh, from the intactogen family. Um, and then there are a few others that are kind of outside, you know, the typical psychedelic sphere. Uh, there are deliriants like scopolamine, seems to be pretty good at promoting uh, uh, cortical neuron growth. You mentioned ketamine. And there are a few others that um, are interesting that are just completely outside the realm of, of psychoactive drugs. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if your listeners would really care about some of those. So maybe but there's a lot. Talk about there's a those. lot of different types of drugs. There's a fair amount. So that you know, there's a certain biochemical pathways that lead mm -hmm. to this neuronal growth, and you can you can activate this biochemical pathway in a few different ways. And so you mm -hmm. can imagine that there's different classes of drugs that produce the same phenotype, the structural neuronal growth. Mm -hmm. And of course, our lab is is heavily invested in trying to identify you know, non-hallucinogenic psychoplastogens as potentially sc scalable uh, treatments for a lot of neuropsychiatric disease. Mm -hmm. so, so you've got a variety of drugs that are somewhat diverse, um, relatively diverse, meaning like they probably activate, they don't activate the same, each one is not activating the same set of receptors. Nonetheless, they have some kind of convergent effect in terms of what's happening to cells after they're doing whatever they're doing as individual drugs. You mentioned convergence onto this particular pathway. Can you dwell on that for a minute? What is this pathway and what's the difference between like a cellular signal transduction pathway inside of a cell versus a receptor that is being bound to? So receptors are the actual physical targets for the drug. So the drug will bind to a receptor, but once it binds to the receptor, it'll induce a conformational change in that protein that will allow it to couple to other uh, signal transducers, other molecules that will carry that signal down further that ultimately leads to the final product, in this case, cortical neuron growth. And so you're right, there are a whole bunch of different receptors that can ultimately turn on the cortical neuron growth, but the downstream pathway that seems to be really critical 
uh, involves, you know, we still don't know all of the details of this, and this is a major focus of our group is to understand the, the molecular and biochemical mechanisms that, you know, by which these drugs can produce this effect. Um, but there's a couple of proteins that we know are really critical. Uh, one is this protein called track B. Uh, it is the high affinity target for uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor and all the neuroscientists listening in the audience are all well aware of BDNF. BDNF is probably one of the uh, most well-known proteins that induce neuronal growth. Uh, so track B seems to be really critical uh, in this pathway. And then another uh, kinase that is really important is this uh, molecule mTOR. And mTOR um, is involved in the production of all of the proteins that you need for neuroplasticity, the, the structural proteins that allow the, the skeleton, the cytoskeleton of the cell to change so that you can actually um, induce, you know, uh, new growth. And also the ion channels that are really necessary for um, transferring these electrical signals between, between neurons. Okay. So you've, you've, created this, um, you've created a new drug. So you take Ibogaine, you chop off a piece of it and it retains its ability to tap into that cellular pathway. And you still get this psychoplastogenic effect where these cortical neurons can, can grow new connections. It mm -hmm. gets rid of some of its undesirable effects. Um, how do you test for things like hallucinogenic potential in a mouse? Yeah. So when we started the Ibogaine work, um, the only way to really, well, there's a couple of ways to do it, um, but there's one that's a little easier than the other. So I'd say the, the traditional way to do this is with something called drug discrimination. And uh, it, it works very well if you, you know, say you have, you know, uh, a drug like LSD and you're looking for drugs like LSD and you want to ask the question, does this produce a similar effect as LSD? And the way this works is you would typically train uh, a rodent, usually it's a rat, to press one lever if you give it LSD and press a different lever if you give it, let's say, saline. And then after a while, the, the rat gets really good at this task. And so in a way, um, you know, you're, you're asking it a question every time you give it a new drug is, do you think you got LSD or do you think you got saline? Then after you train it up, you give them a novel compound, something they'd never seen before. And if they press the LSD lever, then you can assume that the drug produces LSD like effects. And if they press the saline lever, then you can assume that it, it doesn't produce LSD like effects. That's not typically how we have looked at these compounds because that is incredibly labor intensive. Um, and, and very costly and, and time consuming. And so there's another assay in rodents called the, the mouse head twitch response assay. And this is particularly in, in mice. And um, it's a behavioral phenotype that is very characteristic of serotonergic psychedelics like 5-MeO-DMT, LSD, psilocin, and, and others. Uh, if you administer one of these drugs to, to a mouse, there will be this very rapid rotational movement of the head. And you can simply quantify the number of times that they, they, uh, they have these head twitches. Uh, and that gives you a really nice uh, predictive assay for hallucinogenic potential in people. And Adam Halberstadt's group uh, did some really beautiful work just published recently uh, where they demonstrated that there was almost perfect correlation uh, between human hallucinogenic potency and potency in this head twitch response assay. Um, and so I, in my opinion, the head twitch response assay is probably the most predictive uh, in vivo assay that we have for hallucinogenic potential in people. Now, you know, the head twitch response assay is, is really great from that perspective, but it's problematic for a couple of other reasons. Uh, number one, it's it involves a lot of animals. And so we always try to reduce the number of animals that we use in research. Uh, and because it involves a lot of animals, you can't really do high throughput drug discovery with it. You, you can't test very many compounds. And so if you want to make lots of structural changes, test lots of molecules, um, that's not really an ideal assay for that. Plus, every time you put one of these compounds into an animal, you have to think about pharmacokinetics. That's something that most people don't think about uh, when they think about drug discovery there's two things you have to worry about. Number one, you have to worry about efficacy. Does the drug turn on the pathways that you care about? But number two, you have to determine, does the drug actually get to the target? 
And, you know, all the targets that we care about are in the brain. So they have to cross the blood brain barrier, which is very challenging. So you might have a drug that has really great efficacy. You put it into the rodent. It doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. Therefore you get no response. And so you, that doesn't really help you to develop better drugs. And so it'd be better if we could do a cellular assay for hallucinogenic potential. And that's um, where I teamed up with my colleague, Lin Tien just recently, and we published a paper um, about a new biosensor that we call Cyclite. And Cyclite is actually a genetically encoded uh, fluorescent protein that can predict the hallucinogenic potential of a molecule uh, just in a dish. Uh, and so the idea was really simple. We just took the serotonin 2A receptor, uh, which is the target of psychedelics and is responsible for their hallucinogenic effects. We lopped off the, the intracellular part of that protein and we fused on this, this other fluorescent protein. And so when a molecule binds to the receptor, it'll induce a conformational change in that fluorescent protein on the intracellular side of the receptor. And uh, agonists like LSD and, and uh, 5-MeO-DMT They'll turn on the sensor and uh, non-hallucinogenic compounds either won't turn on the sensor or they'll actually turn off the sensor. Hmm. So basically you take the 5-HT2A receptor itself, you modify it, you staple this other fluorescent protein thing to it. And now when a drug activates that receptor, it causes this thing to light up and you can see that happen. That's right. So um, is this, so the 5-HT2A receptor is it necessarily true that a drug that activates that will have a hallucinogenic effect or is it possible to activate it without that effect? In other words, should we think of the hallucinogenic effect as being synonymous with activation of this receptor or is there something more particular about the specific way that some drugs activate it? Yeah, I definitely think it's the latter. It's the way that some drugs activate it. So we actually know that there are quote unquote agonists, molecules that will activate the receptor that will not produce hallucinations. Uh, a really great example is a molecule called lyceride that people have known about for many, many years. It is, a, is an agonist of the 2A receptor, but it's non-hallucinogenic. And so um, this is where I think pharmacology gets really, really interesting because it's not as simple as like one receptor, one functional output. Mm -hmm. There's a, a concept known as functional selectivity or biased agonism, which, you know, to, to summarize it is you can have a molecule bind to a receptor but you can get differential functional responses. And so in the, in the case of, of something like, um, like the 5 receptor, we can think of at least like there's, there's many, many outcomes from, from turning on, if you will, the 5-HD2A receptor. One outcome though, are, are potential hallucinogenic effects. And a second outcome is the ability to promote cortical neuron growth or neuroplasticity. <clears throat> and so what our group has found is that there are some molecules that will bind to the 5-HD2A receptor and turn on cortical neuron growth only and not produce hallucinogenic effects. And then there are molecules like LSD and 5-MeO-DMT that, that do both. Mm -hmm. I see. So this, um, this makes perfect sense. You guys have sort of dissected this down to the, the molecular level and you find dissociations like this. And so it makes sense that, that, um, one would then conclude, well, it should be possible, um, to engineer drugs such that they have this desirable psychoplastogenic effect that's going to be useful for psychiatric applications, but they don't have these hallucinogenic effects. Now the and ultimately, this is an empirical question that relates to this question in psychedelic medicine of whether or not the psychedelic effects per se, the hallucinatory component, is actually important for some of the therapeutic outcomes that we've seen in humans so far. So I think I can imagine your perspective on that. Can you kind of summarize the two perspectives on that right now? What are, what are sort of the arguments in favor of the hallucinogenic component in humans being important for therapeutic outcomes, at least their magnitude and duration? And, and what, what are some of the counter arguments to that? And where do you think this will go in the next, you know, two, three, four years? Sure. Um, so first I, you know, I want to, I want to start off by saying this is not an either or story. It's not, you know, either it's hallucinogenic or non hallucinogenic. I don't think that's true at all. I think that these kind of first generation hallucinogenic molecules absolutely could have benefit um, in the clinic. And I think 
patients will be helped by them. And so I'll try to summarize some of the arguments. Um, on the, the hallucinogenic side of things, there, there are some people who believe that uh, the, the uh, hallucinogenic or the subjective effects of these drugs, particularly their ability to induce mystical type experiences, are critical for these molecules to produce uh, their therapeutic effects. Um, and that's, that's, that's one hypothesis. I think that the, um, the, the evidence in support of that really has been that there's been a, a correlation between um, mystical type experiences and the uh, therapeutic efficacy seen in several, several trials so far. Uh, but from my perspective, um, you know, correlation does not imply causation. And so we need to be very careful about assuming that the hallucinogenic effects or the, the mystical type experiences, I should be careful on, on the wording that I use here, um, are absolutely essential for uh, therapeutic, the therapeutic effects of psychedelics. Now, on one hand, I think that it's very possible that these effects could be beneficial for a subset of patients. And as to why, I'm not really sure. Maybe it's because they facilitate insight into uh, a patient's disease. Maybe they um, help to promote um, an interaction between the patient and the therapist. Maybe it's an enhanced placebo effect. I don't know. But um, I do think that some patients will benefit from this approach. Now, from my perspective, what I've really been concerned about has been scalability. And uh, as it stands now, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is not a very scalable treatment. Uh, you have to go in to the, to the clinic um, to prepare yourself for, you know, your experience. Then if you're taking something like psilocybin, you're going to be in the clinic with a couple of healthcare uh, professionals for many hours uh, mm -hmm. to just to monitor you to make sure that uh, you're safe. And then there's integration therapy after that. And, uh, and that is just not a model that's going to be amenable to treating the number of patients that really suffer from these disorders. And I think that's something that is really important to remember is that one in five people will suffer from a neuropsychiatric disease at some point in their life. And we're talking about a billion people. And so how sad would it be if if the only way that patients could benefit from psychedelic medicine was through this, this in-clinic administration and experience. And so one of the questions that our group was trying to address is whether or not we could get any therapeutic benefit from these drugs by removing you know, their hallucinogenic effects, which is really what necessitates their in-clinic administration. If you remove the hallucinogenic effects, presumably you could have take-home therapeutics that a patient could, you know, go to the local pharmacy, pick it up, bring it home, put it in their medicine cabinet, just like they would a lot of other drugs. Uh, and in that way, you could reach a, a larger number of patients. Um, go ahead. Do you want do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I want to. Um, I, I'd like to dwell on this for a minute. So let's let's just take something like major depressive disorder as an example. Um, so around the scalability issue, all of that makes sense. Obviously, if something necessitates you being in the clinic to have you know a six-hour psychedelic trip and two people have to watch you, et cetera, et cetera, that's that is very unscalable. It literally takes hours of time per patient. You can basically only do one patient at a time. It's just a lot of human hours that go into that. Sort of the um, opposite extreme of that would be a drug that we might describe as entirely passive. So, you know, the pill that you could take home and take that didn't even require therapy. How mm -hmm. do you think that's at all plausible that there could be a drug that one takes that treats severe major depressive disorder that doesn't even require you to have therapy in conjunction with taking it? I do. Um, and so, you know, when I, so, so something I, I will say is that if you add psychotherapy to pretty much any medicine, you will get enhanced results. You'll get better results. And I mean, I think that's probably true for your, for your diabetes medicine. And so some patients will absolutely need uh, uh, therapy. And that's why I think, and in some cases, people might need this, this mystical type experience plus therapy to get better. And so I kind of think of it as, you know, a tiered approach. And so if you could have a scalable drug that the vast majority of people could take at home, and let's say that you could treat 
80% of those people, I mean, that would be incredible. And then the next 20% that are treatment resistant to that, that therapy, then maybe they need to combine it with, uh, with psychotherapy. Now, again, if you have a take-home medicine, you can start doing psychotherapy over Zoom. Uh, we know that telemedicine has been greatly you know, improved uh, due to COVID. Uh, and so that would, again, be a way to increase the scalability. And then for the next subset of patients where maybe that doesn't work either, and they need the mystical type experience, that, that should still be available to them. Mm -hmm. And do you think, you know, when you think about something, uh, we'll just continue using depression as an example. I, I don't remember all of the specific statistics, but we know that SSRIs work for some number of people, a significant proportion of people, but not everyone. Do you think that, you know, for these psychiatric conditions, that our knowledge is just not fine grained enough in terms of uh, the specific phenotypes that are causing these conditions, such that, you know, instead of thinking of it as major depression, maybe there's really five or 10 or 15 sort of subtypes of that. And each one will respond differently to a different kind of a drug. Do you think that's maybe kind of what's going on with some of these uh, psychiatric conditions? And we just haven't discovered all of the drugs that treat these different sub phenotypes? Well, I think that that is very, very possible. There, are there definitely is a spectrum for every single neuropsychiatric disease. And what I'm very hopeful is that we're going to be able to use translatable biomarkers to really do personalized medicine uh, and really find people who are likely to respond to a, you know, a particular type of medicine and those who, who aren't. Uh, that is, you know, kind of the, uh, the frontier in, in translational neuroscience research right now. And so we'll see where it goes, but I think that that is, is very, very possible. And so what, what gives you that optimism that there could be drugs that are, are these sort of uh, completely passive drugs that have very good effects, but don't require any, any, any psychotherapy. Sort of, yeah. Any, any of that. Yeah. So a couple of cases. So uh, you know, so first um, there's even some suggestion that psychedelics may not need, you know, uh, psychotherapy uh, to be associated with them. For instance, you know, ketamine right now, I know it's not a traditional psychedelic compound, but it does produce mystical type experiences. And some people have argued that that correlates with therapeutic efficacy. Um, ketamine is administered without psychotherapy. Now you go into the clinic, you receive your infusion and, and you leave. Um, and ketamine is really good at promoting cortical neuron growth. And so again, in some cases, like that might be sufficient for some patients. Uh, it might not be sufficient for all patients, but for some patients, definitely. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that I think that you don't necessarily need the, the psychotherapy. Now, the other, the other reason goes back to preclinical research. When I originally started this work, I, I had the hypothesis that you absolutely needed training, that you give a drug, it would put the brain in a plastic state you would then give some kind of training and then that's how you would rewire neural circuitry. And I, and I do think that that works really well. It works exceptionally well. And you will get more robust responses if you, if you do that. But then we started doing experiments where we just gave drug. And even with just the drug, we were getting these really kind of long lasting uh, behavioral effects after a single administration. This is not like an SSRI where you have to give it every day for three weeks in order to see efficacy, we gave one dose and then look two weeks later and we would see a behavioral change. And I think that really comes down to the circuits that are involved. And we found that based on the genetic localization of kind of the receptors that we're impacting, we get certain enhancements of certain circuits in the brain. Uh, and that kind of specific rewiring leads to long lasting behavioral changes. Um, I mean, the way that I would start to think about that, I mean, that's super interesting because I, I would generally have the same line of thinking that you described that you, you originally had, that the plasticity is permissive, but it needs to be directed in, with, with training in some way. Now, do you think it's possible that, or, or how do you think about this? Um, you know, are there some circuits in the brain that have intrinsic characteristics where, you know, there's almost probably like an attractor state for the types of dynamics that circuit wants to feel and you can get it off track, but if you just sort of uh, loosen things up and create some sort of permissive signal, it will tend to fall back into this, into this particular pattern that it's maybe genetically predisposed to have. I think that's possible. Um, I wouldn't call it necessarily a loosening though. I think that, I think that that's, you know, what you hear a lot of times is like psychedelics, you know, shake the snow globe and, and mix it all up. And then it kind of all falls back into place as it, as it should. 
In my mind, it really has more to do with, you know, the genetic localization of the targets. And like I said, you know, the dysfunction of those layer five pyramidal neurons in the cortex, we know is a, a hallmark of a whole bunch of neuropsychiatric diseases. Mm -hmm. And so if you can give a drug that completely restores that uh, structure and function, then it's not surprising that it produces kind of lasting behavioral changes. And actually, a point to a paper that we published with my, my collaborator, uh, Yi Zuo, in um, molecular psychiatry. And this is a drug that we call tabernanthalog. It's, um, it's an analog of, of, of both ibogaine and 5-MeO-DMT. It's a non-hallucinogenic cycloplastogen. But we did something really interesting. We we're talking about like with no training, single administration of a drug, we um, you know, gave the animals unpredictable mild stress, which tends to result in a whole bunch of behavioral deficits. It causes uh, anxiety phenotypes. It causes depression-like phenotypes. It causes cortical neuron atrophy. It causes dysfunction of parvalvium and positive interneuron function. It causes deficits in calcium dynamics in the brain. And we gave one dose of the drug. And then we didn't do anything else, no training, waited 24 hours, a time period when the drug was completely cleared from the body. And then we looked and all of those things were fixed. The dendritic spines were, had regrown, the parvalvian positive interneuron function was restored, the calcium dynamics were restored, and all of the behavioral effects were restored. And so I really think that there's, there's constant communication between cell types in the brain. And so if you can restore a critical neuron, the function of a critical neuron, like um, a layer five pyramidal neuron in the cortex, I think it has the ability to communicate with its partners and and help to restore their function as well and globally and globally heal damaged circuits i see um so this is super interesting Here, here's a question i have and maybe it'll clarify something that we were mentioning earlier when we talk about these layer five pyramidal neurons in the frontal cortex that are so important for things like depression and other psychiatric conditions when we talk about them atrophying do we mean that the cells actually die or do we simply mean that some of the connections are lost and then what these drugs are doing is restoring those connections. Yeah. In the case of the neuropsychiatric diseases, it's not really cell death. It is really physical atrophy. So the, the, the processes are shrinking. Those dendritic spines are, are uh, getting culled and synapses are being lost, but those can, can be regrown and restored. Now I'll point to a really interesting preclinical study that my, um, my colleague uh, Connor Liston uh, performed uh, you know, related to ketamine's effects. And so one of the big questions is, is always about causality, right? Like what is causally important for the sustained effects of these drugs? And for a long time, you know, we had, a, you know, hypothesized that the structural plasticity is really critical uh, to the lasting effects of the drugs, but really it was just correlation. You know, we knew that, you know, structural plasticity correlated really, really well with therapeutic effects. Like I mentioned, the traditional antidepressants, they take a really long time to induce structural plasticity. They take a long time to um, have therapeutic efficacy as well. Ketamine, it you know can increase dendritic spine density within 24 hours, and that lasts about a week, and that correlates perfectly with its therapeutic effects in humans. Psilocybin seems to be able to promote spine growth for much longer. I mean, Alex Kwan had a really beautiful study recently demonstrating that it, it lasts for about a month. And that seems to be roughly kind of how long it lasts in humans too. So all of this is still correlation at this point. Mm -hmm. And then Connor did something really clever. Connor would induce depression, depressive like phenotypes in a rodent, and he would use a genetic construct to, oh, so then he, he induced depressive like phenotypes, gave ketamine, and then regrow those, regrew those dendritic spines. And then he used a genetic construct to specifically photo ablate the newly formed dendritic spines mm. only, mm. not everything else, just the new ones. And when he did that, the long lasting effects completely gone. So you give ketamine, the mm -hmm. spines grow, you get an effect. You give yep. ketamine, the spines grow, you photo ablate those spines. There's no antidepressant effects anymore, which does suggest that structural plasticity. Yeah. Stru structural plasticity is causally related to the lasting effects ah, okay, of ketamine. Okay. Gotcha. Wow. That makes sense. So that's, that's a really cool experiment. So you guys have the precision now that you can go in and literally get, basically choose which synapses in an, in an animal that you want to get rid of. Right. Interesting. So what do you, um, are there any interesting 
you know, there must be some interesting experiments or problems that you're working on now. What's what's on the horizon? Oh, geez. I mean, we only have a couple hours, buddy. <laughs> well, uh, maybe um, pick, pick, let's pick one or two and, and just kind of um, define the problem space for people. I mean, let me think about this. We, you know, of course, we're trying to develop new molecules based on, I'll say that we're, we've got better versions of, of, I think, of every major psychedelic scaffold. And so mm-hmm. be that, I mean, we've reported on kind of a boga compounds, there's tryptamine compounds, amphetamine compounds, ergoline compounds that we're real, real excited about. Um, so hopefully that will be coming up soon. But what I think I'm most excited about is a lot of our mechanistic studies, uh, really trying to understand and how it is that you can produce non-hallucinogenic cycloplastogens and have them modify uh, circuits relevant to neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, that hopefully will be coming out in a series of papers pretty soon, but I think that that's really, really interesting. Um, the, the, the pharmacology is, is surprising, I, I would say that. Hmm. And then, uh, you know, lots of, other, lots of other projects on the horizon. Um, I don't even know where to, where to begin with that. What do you think about the, um, so, so it's intriguing that let, let's just take some of the classic psychedelics as an example, more or less, all of them seem to have the psychoplastogenic effect, but some of them, you know, only last for a few minutes in terms of, you know, before the body's able to metabolize them, DMT would mm-hmm. be an example. Some of them last for many hours. Um, is there anything interesting going on there? Can you, can you, do you think you can have drugs that are really only active in the body for a few minutes, but they do have this full sort of psychoplastogenic effect, or do you require it to sit there for, for longer? No, that, that's uh, one of the first questions that we tried to address. And we published this, uh, work in ACS pharmacology and translational science just a year or so ago. Um, we, we, we had the same thought. I mean, something that really kind of intrigued me about psychedelics in general is that like these molecules get into the brain, they get out of the brain, and then they produce these really lasting effects on neuronal structure and function. Uh, and so I didn't really quite understand how that was and what, like, what is the kind of time frame? How long do they need to stimulate the receptors for? And so we did an experiment where we started to just, you know, uh, give very short pulses of the drug. And so we started with, let's give the drug for three days and see you know, how much the neurons grow. Then let's, let's give the drug for a day. Then let's give the drug for an hour. Then let's give the drug for just 15 minutes and see how long the, uh, see if the neurons grow. And it turns out that even with those really, really short pulses of stimulation, you can get really profound uh, effects on neuronal structure. And it turns out that the reason for that is we think that uh, these compounds turn on a, an auto regulatory feedback loop in the brain. One, it's like flipping a well, like a light switch. As long as you turn it on, um, what happens is mTOR, which I mentioned was that downstream kinase, which is really critical for producing all of the structural and functional proteins that you need for plasticity. mTOR also turns up, turns out to produce uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor BDNF. Mm. So then you start increasing the amount of BDNF. BDNF that can then bind to the track B receptor, and the track B receptor can turn on mTOR. And then this process can, can happen. It's this positive auto-regulatory feedback loop. Exactly how long it happens and what turns it off, we're not entirely sure. Um, but it's a really unique case for a drug to be able to just get it into the brain and get it out of the brain. Normally, what you're trying to do as a medicinal chemist is to have high brain exposure. You want a drug that gets in there and stays there for a really long time so that you're activating the receptor for a long period of time. But of course, doing that usually results in drugs that have a lot of undesired off-target effects because they're sitting around in the body for longer. But if you have a drug that gets in, flips the light switch, and then gets out, you can minimize those off-target safety effects and produce something potentially that is um, more better tolerated. I see. So it sounds like I was going to ask, but it sounds like, you know, this, this self self uh, reinforcing loop that can get activated almost like a light switch, as you mentioned, we don't know what actually turns it off. So uh, for example, in someone with depression, you know, you would imagine that maybe, maybe this pathway was on or activated in some way, and then something shuts it off. So that's still a mystery. It's still a mystery, but I think it's probably homeostatic plasticity. So neurons have some really tightly controlled mechanisms to make sure they're not firing too much or too little. They're kind of at the Goldilocks state. Mm -hmm. And so if you're really kind of like low and you're not very happy and you give a drug that produces this growth, 
then eventually the neuron is going to have a mechanism by which to be, okay, that's too much growth. I don't want to be overexcited because if you stimulate neurons too much, then they'll die because, um, you know, it's just uh, metabolically very taxing for them. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that, that brings me to a related question, which is, um, plasticity is not always a good thing. So you can have too much plasticity. If, if too many connections grew, that would actually become toxic for the cell. Yeah. So one thing that we, we, we found actually in rodents that I think was really interesting. So there's a lot of people, you know, talk about psychedelic microdosing and the potential for, for this or lack thereof. Um, something about microdosing that concerns me is the constant stimulation. You're stimulating the brain every couple of days. Mm. And when we, so we did two studies in a rodent, uh, with dimethyltryptamine, a very rapidly acting, quickly eliminated uh, psychedelic drug. <clears throat> and if you give one single high dose of dimethyltryptamine, you get robust cortical neuron growth. Uh, if you give a low dose of DMT every three days for you know a couple of months, you actually see the opposite. You see cortical neuron retraction. Hmm. And we really think that's because you're overstimulating these cells and you're getting this homeostatic plasticity. The cells are intentionally, you know, culling these, synap these synapses in, in, in dendritic spines so that they don't get overexcited and die. Interesting. So you're giving a sub hallucinogenic dose when you do that? Correct. But the, the dose is still sufficient to turn on the pathway. I see. Interesting. So, so in this microdosing experiment, you get the opposite outcome. You get a retraction in the neurons when you're giving things day by day by day. So in my opinion, I think that um, psychedelic medicine is probably going to be more effective with a single high dose uh, of the compounds rather than a whole bunch of, you know, small doses. Interesting. Well, that's actually good news in some ways, right? So to the extent that that type of treatment is good, at least for some people, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously, uh, less unscalable if you need one mega dose rather than, you know, a number of them. 100%. And in the case of, of, um, using the traditional hallucinogenic psychedelics, like I mentioned, they do hit the 5-HT2B receptor. And if you're just agonizing the 2B receptor once, probably not that big a deal. But if you're microdosing and you're taking a drug every day for, or every couple of days, every third day for weeks, then you really got to worry about problems in the heart. Interesting. So that'll be something to watch out for because that is something that I think is happening more and more. You're seeing a lot of products in the what you would probably call the gray market, depending on where you're at in the country, where you know people are meant to eat one or two gummies of something containing psilocybin or LSD every day. Yeah, I think that you know counterintuitively, uh, microdosing might be more dangerous than a single high administration of the of the compounds. Interesting. I've never actually heard that articulated before. Um, so. In the time we have left, um, why don't we why don't we discuss uh, uh, something a little bit different? Um, are there any other you know? So who, who are the other labs that are doing interesting work that you're following that people might go check out that are doing things in the general area that you're doing, but but not quite the same stuff? So um, you know, I'll say that I think that the field is growing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when <clears throat> when I started my academic career. Or very few labs looking at like the basic mechanisms of psychedelics. And fortunately, that is starting to change. Uh, there are a lot more groups doing this now. And so um, I, I'll name a few. I'll try to go from west to east so I, I can make sure I don't forget anybody. Uh, one of the first persons that comes to mind is Boris Heifetz. Uh, I'm actually collaborating with Boris. Uh, Boris has done a lot of work on you know, the effects of MDMA, the mechanisms of MDMA, and uh, very interested in kind of brain mapping. Um, and, you know, Boris and I have a couple of really interesting collaborations going on now. So hopefully something will come of that soon. Um, down in Santa Cruz, uh, Yi Zuo is uh, one of my good friends and Yi has been on several of the papers with us. She's an expert in two photon microscopy, uh, in vivo imaging, and so uh, I'm very happy to say that she just got her Schedule One license, and now she can start doing some more studies on psychedelics. So you can expect that coming out from her uh, more. Uh, in San Diego, you know, there's Adam Halberstadt has been doing this for many, many years, particularly behavioral neuropharmacology. You know, looking at the effects of, of different uh, structurally modified psychedelics in things like the head twitch response assay. Um, they move. Over there's John McCorvey in uh, in Wisconsin who is doing a lot of receptor pharmacology and signaling and trying to understand how these molecules differentially impact you know biochemical pathways. 
Um, my uh, good collaborator, um, Jamie Peters at University of Colorado. Um, she is very interested in trying to understand how psychedelics and related compounds might be anti-addictive uh, medicines. She's doing a lot of really interesting work there. Um, let's keep moving over. Uh, of course, uh, Alex Kwan, who was at Yale, uh, who will be moving to Cornell pretty soon, has been doing a lot of two-photon in vivo imaging. Uh, he had a really nice paper in Neuron showing that psilocybin um, promoted dendritic spine growth for a very long period of time, for at least a month. Um, of course, there's, there's Brian Roth, who's doing lots of really great structural biology work to try to understand how psychedelics differentially, um, differentially activate the 5-HT2A receptor and other GPCRs. And I think Brian's group is also trying to develop uh, some of these non-hallucinogenic analogs of psychedelics for, for treating uh, brain disorders. Um, I know I'm forgetting so many other people. Uh, Gould Dolan is doing some really nice stuff at, at Hopkins, who, um, she, you know, she's really interested in the social, pro-social effects of a lot of these compounds. Um, I'm trying to think of mainly the people that are on the kind of preclinical mechanistic side of things. Oh, in terms of uh, pharmacology, oh, I almost forgot, Javier Gonzalez Misa. Javier was one of the people that really inspired me to get into this field. Uh, he's really studied a lot of the molecular interactions of the 5-HT2A receptor and how there's this differential signaling. You know, this idea of functional selectivity at the 2A receptor, you know, was really pioneered in large part by a lot of Javier's work. Uh, there's Chuck Nichols at LSU. Uh, he's doing a lot of great work on inflammatory processes related to psychedelics. Of course, uh, Chuck's dad, Dave Nichols, was, I think, probably my scientific hero. Um, you know, Dave was a medicinal chemist that was really trying to understand how the structure of psychedelics impacts th their function. And if it wasn't for Dave, I wouldn't be here today, I think. Reading his papers as a graduate student really inspired me to, to, to get into this field. Um, and then there's Dalibar Samas at Columbia, who is making a whole bunch of analogs of Ibogaine and another company. Sorry, I don't want to forget anybody. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's a lot, which is good. So there's a lot going on. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting that gets less attention, I think, just because, you know, the nature of these, when you talk about psychedelics, people think about the the mental effects that they tend to have. And, and then you start talking about all the, the psychiatric um, applications. One of the things that I think is super interesting is some of the, some of the other kinds of effects that might be here. So things that are happening in the periphery, like like anti-inflammatory effects. What are some of those non-brain effects that are super interesting that people are trying to understand? Yeah. So the serotonin 2A receptor is, it's one of my favorite G protein coupled receptors because it's everywhere and it's involved in a lot of different things and, you know, being expressed on immune cells, um, both in the periphery and in the central nervous system, there's 2A receptors on microglia. And so something that my group is very interested in is, is looking at the effects of psychedelics and related molecules on neuroinflammation, but in the periphery, you know, Chuck's shown a lot of, uh, a lot of examples of these compounds having anti-inflammatory effects. And so, you know, could they have some potential for treating, um, uh, peripheral disorders, asthma, uh, autoimmune diseases. I mean, I think this was, is really, really interesting. You can imagine it'd be pretty easy to make a, it's hard to get a drug into the brain, but it's uh, a lot easier to keep it out of the brain. Hmm. And so you can probably make some peripherally uh, localized versions of psychedelics to have some um, uh, anti-inflammatory effects in the periphery. Interesting. Well, David, I want to thank you for your time and I don't want to take too much more. Um, are there any final thoughts you want to leave people with just on this general field and what they should look out for or anything interesting that you think is coming up? Um, I just want to encourage people to keep supporting this field. I think that it's, uh, you know, an incredible group of researchers. Um, it's a pretty tight knit group and, uh, I hope it continues to grow. Um, and I think we just all need to kind of be supportive of each other. Cause at the end of the day, I think that everyone in this field just really wants what's best for patients. And I think a lot of different approaches are going to be important and, uh, we should be supportive of people, you know, looking at, at all options. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's probably it. I'm, I'm very happy that the field is where it is today. When I started out, I was given a lot of advice to not 
propose, you know, my, my proposals when I went on the job market were related to psychedelics. And people told me that like, you're never going to get a job at a big university. <laughs> and so uh, I'm very happy that the tides are changing and that now, you know, my trainees that are going out for jobs now, they have no qualms about having proposals related to psychedelics. And I'm, you know, hearing from the younger generation that are wanting to get into this field. Um, oh, and related to that, I should put a plug. I'm hiring two postdoctoral positions uh, to understand the, the mechanisms of psychedelics. So if you're interested, please, uh, please contact me. So, so, well, just one last question, I guess. So when, you know, when you were on the job market and you had these proposals, you were getting advice not to move in that direction. What made you do it anyway? It's too compelling not to. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of people that are really suffering from these brain disorders. Like I said, one in five people. And looking at all of the data that had been coming out of, of some really, you know, really incredible pioneering work from people like Roland Griffiths and Matt Johnson and, and others. Uh, it just, it seemed too compelling not to pursue this because there was the translational value, the ability to help people was really, really huge. And on a basic science side, in my opinion, you know, psychedelics are among the most powerful drugs that impact the human brain. And the only way we'll have a full understanding of how the brain works is if we understand how psychedelics do what they do. And so I uh, just decided to go for it. All right. Well, David Olson, thank you for your time. Thank you.